is some of the yeah. <laughs> so uh, some of you might have seen this plot already, but this is specifically a plot from the CHAMP satellite and its orbit and how its deceleration changed over time. And this deceleration is kind of correlated to air drag. And so you can see typically it follows a pretty common pattern as it goes through the atmosphere. But what's really important to note is every time, almost every time it reached this peak, here, uh, there are these giant spikes in drag that were not expected to be seen. And this also happened when it crossed and was in the cusp region. And so this meant that there was a large increase in air drag when it crossed the cusp. And that leads to an idea of a large increase in particle density in the cusp during that time. And the speed bumps that are in red are in the cusp region. And also the CHAMP satellite saw specifically field aligned currents or FACs during this time, suggesting that there was a large correlation between field aligned currents and this upwelling in neutrals, this increased density of these neutral particles. And so before we get into more of our data specifically, I'm going to talk a bit about different types of upwelling. So the type one upwelling is the type that we're not going to be talking about really today. But just to mention it, you can see it at the bottom here, if this is our atmosphere, that type one upwelling is dual heating. That happens a little lower, and a lot of us know what dual heating is, but to talk about the one that I'm here to study and to talk about is type two upwelling. And this is specifically related to particle precipitation. Well, and by that, it's like electron precipitation and field aligned currents are associated with this type of upwelling. And for a little demonstration here, what this upwell and how this upwelling works really is that these precipitating electrons come in, they follow the field line, and they come down and into this plasma that's filled with ions, neutrals, electrons, the whole bunch. And what heats up and moves first are these electrons. And so you can see they come out of the plasma and move higher in altitude. And what happens is that now you have this charge discrepancy where these electrons are up there in altitude, but the ions are lagging behind. They're still lower in altitude, creating this antipolar electric field. And what happens next is that the ions, these charged particles, want to fall out. And that's how ions upwelling and upwell. And that's kind of what you, we talk about when you hear the phrase type 2 ion upwelling. But what we are suggesting is, as you might have heard, I used the word neutral upwelling previously. What does ion upwelling have to do with that? As you might have noticed from going the last slide to this slide, these neutrals moved up slightly in altitude. The ions, in order to move up to follow these electrons, would have to collide with the neutrals to escape that original plasma and move upwards in altitude, uh, heating these neutrals and raising their altitude, causing this upwelling. Um, this is something that's new that's kind of being looked at and something that I'm looking at. And so one thing before we move on to the next couple parts, Another thing that's on top of this type two uh, neutral upwelling are these things called PMAPs or polar moving aurora forms. And so kind of before I show you this fun video that I really hope works is uh, <laughs> uh, well, these are actually aurora that are very much associated with field aligned currents in the cusp and are also like in other words, also associated with these precipitating electrons in the cusp. And so what you see is just like the name, these are aurora that move forward. They start at, ooh, it's rougher on a shared screen, I guess. But um, so if you want to see a smoother video, let me know afterwards, and I'm more than happy to show you in person or send it out. But basically, this was a video provided by Fred Sigurnitz from Eunice, and you can see these thin wisps of aurora that keep coming through. They start at a lower latitude and move forward. It's Again, another wisp starting lower, moving forward, and these wisps just keep coming through. And this is a type of aurora, aurora that we call PMAPs. And again, these are aurora that are associated with field line currents, as a lot of other aurora, but precipitating electrons that we specifically launch into for what we will be talking about. And so moving back to talking about type 2 neutral upwelling and how these two things come together, PMAPs and type 2 neutral upwelling, is that it, it, the key lies in the time scales of how those particles move. As we saw from the images I showed previously, those electrons are the first things to go. They're the first ones to heat up and move up in altitude. They move on the order of seconds, approximately. Uh, but these ions, they move 
they, they follow pretty closely in time. There is a little bit of a lag, so they take about tens of seconds to follow those electrons to follow that ambipolar field that's created. But the real key here is that neutrals can take tens of minutes. Uh, they can take a lot longer to <clears throat> rise from those collisions and reach higher altitudes and do their upwelling. And the key with PMAPs is that they have an approximate 10 to 15 minute periodicity. So these waves of PMAPs, these waves of precipitating electrons that deposit their energy and cause this type two heating happen before the neutrals can actually fully relax and go back to their original altitude as these neutrals can take tens of minutes to get up to a higher altitude, much less thin it like go upwelling and relaxing fully. So the neutrals don't have time and they don't return to their initial altitude, but they stop at a little higher up, causing this to be the new higher initial altitude. And then another amount of heating comes by as this wave of PMAP passes by, causing these neutrals to start their upwelling process again, but from a new higher initial altitude, causing them to, and this happens over and over, as we saw from the waves of PMAPs, slowly raising the altitude of the neutrals kind of in this little wave. And that's how they can reach these higher altitudes. And this is what we call the PMAP effect. This is pretty new. Um, and some papers are currently being written and currently being edited to actually introduce this more and more. And so to go to data that we actually measured is the main rock, the rocket I want to talk about today is the Cypher 2 rocket. Uh, this was launched above PMAFs uh, from Svalbard, Norway on January 18, 2000, 2008. So this is a rocket from a while ago. And this figure over here shows it's data from the Meridian Scanning Photometer in Longyearbyen. And so we can see these, P, these very distinct PMAFs coming through. And this is a little box that we were launched, that we launched in. So we launched specifically over PMAFs. So that's something to keep in mind when we get to our data. And this was a rocket that was very interesting. <laughs> and her, um, we actually reached an apogee that was extremely high for sounding rockets. It reached 1,500 kilometers. That does not happen often with sounding rockets. So we got to see high altitudes, which is key to what we'll be seeing in the next couple of slides. And another thing is it did accidentally go into flat spin. So that made data interesting. So the rocket just kind of, it, it just kind of went into this coning that was quite extreme. But that also meant that we knew a coning period of that rocket, so we could figure out kind of where it was pointing and when. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And another thing that we saw is during this launch was not only, as you saw from the previous figure, that we had we did specifically launch over PMAS, but we had an instrument on board to measure electron <laughs> temperature, so we could see whether or not those electrons were heated, indicating that type two upwelling as we mentioned previously. Uh, so that's kind of what that figure three is. And figure four is just from the ISCAT Svalbard uh, radar during the launch to also show another thing here that yes, electron temperature was increased during this time that was heating from that electron population. So our data specifically that I'm talking about uh, came from our uh, UVPMT, our ultraviolet photomultiplier tube. This was, is specifically used to measure the neutrals. And as around these altitudes, neutrals are usually atomic oxygen or a large population of them are, and they emit at around 130.4 nanometers and 135.6. Um, so in the UV, and we specifically had a photomultiplier tube that looks in these wavelengths, um, and there's a little cutout view to the right there. And something to keep in mind uh, is that 130.4 nanometers is optically thick. So that causes some of the data analysis to be a little difficult to get a density, but the idea is that the brightness of these emission lines suggests that it, uh, a relationship to the density of these neutral atomic oxygen particles. And so the actual data from Cypher 2 is UVPMT. So as mentioned previously, the rocket went into flat spin. Uh, so we had to use the coding period, which we knew was approximately 14 seconds. Um, from other instruments on the rocket, and this <laughs> identified 12 different events of increased neutral density. Uh, actually going to identify these events was a little difficult as, as um, the data is, that we saw was like from figure seven here, where it was just this voltage output over time and we would see these spikes in voltages. So how do you know if there were just multiple events, were they all the same event? 
uh, we use that coning period where we use that 14 seconds where this similar spike of similar size and voltage was seen over and over again at around 14 seconds. So this is an example of uh, uh, event five listed in that table over there. And so we then looked at data where we were able to visually see these PMAPs and tried to see if a wave of those PMAPs aligned with these events of enhanced neutral density. Uh, half of them were, so six of them were aligned, which is extremely exciting, uh, but that also does mean that half of them weren't. But there, it, but there are some uh, things that we do want to look into with that, as uh, as we mentioned with the PMAP effect, with the time scales uh, if, of neutral upwelling, it might take a while to actually see those enhanced neutral densities at the altitude we're looking, as it can it can take a good amount of time for them to rise enough in altitude for us to see. So there doesn't necessarily we're unsure if, like how well that would realistically correlate. Um, so it needs to be looked into more. But one of the other things that was extremely key is from these events of these 12 was the viewing altitude. So the lowest altitude that we saw these was around 714.3 kilometers and going up to even above 1455. These are extremely high altitudes to see enhanced neutral densities. It was unexpected. Uh, and that's why we're talking about it now, this older rocket. Uh, we saw neutral upwelling above PMAFs at unexpectedly high altitudes. And so that was very exciting, very new, and we wanted to look into it more. So one of the ways we did that is uh, using the Sadler and Auto model, and actually Brent Sadler is right there in the back, so <laughs> he's over here. But this was a three fluid time independent, time dependent, a numerical model to simulate particle upflow. So, and that specifically observed how these populations responded to type two heating. So, and we know it's specifically type two heating because we, or it was, a, it was included that it had 100 EV precipitating electrons typical for PMAPs, as well as a flux of four milliwatts per meter squared, which is again, typical for PMAPs. And as talked about previously, precipitating electrons correlate to that type two <laughs> upflow. Um, and so it uses data from IRI and MSIS to kind of get that baseline as well. And so this is the equation that the model uses to actually get um, a lot of how these neutrals move vertically. Uh, there's an infection term, pressure balance, ionization recombination, and momentum transfer. And something that was found was that the momentum transfer term is the most significant, if not just extremely significant term when it comes to neutral upwelling and their vertical motion. And so from this model, uh, we have some results here. So that's what figure eight is. And something that I do want to point out is that it's all of these plots are separated into two sections. We have A and B below, where A is a range of percentages from like zero to 50%, and part B is zero to 5%. So that's extremely important to just point out for those of you who might not be able to see. Um, and that was done so we could actually see the change in. Uh, percentages there. But so this is actually a plot of relative neutral density uh, increase over time at multiple different altitudes. And the model calculated for up to a thousand kilometers, which is the top one up there. And you can see that there is a significant enhancement in neutral densities at these high altitudes. Because that gets to about, what is that? That's a scale of 50%. It's a little below that, of course. But that's 50% enhancement in neutral densities relative to the baseline that um, MSIS gave. So that's something, it, the results here showed an increase in neutral densities at high altitudes, specifically using precipitating electrons and specifically relating it back to type two neutral upwelling. So as a quick little summary before I go into some of our future work, is that Cypher 2, that rocket measured 12 separate neutral density enhancements a lot at high altitudes while flying over PMAPs. So that in neutral density enhancement at high altitudes associated with that type two upwelling. And of those events, six were directionally co six of them directionally coincided with these PMAPs, suggesting even more of a connection between that type two ion upflow and that neutral upwelling. And then this wasn't just seen through the this wasn't just seen through the data, but it was also or through the measurements of Cypher 2, but it was also seen through the model as well as it used type two uh, through those precipitating electrons. And we saw those <laughs> neutral density enhancements at high altitudes. 
So it's still new. We need more stuff to look at. Uh, so one of the things that we're working on is this 3UQ satellite, which is called 3UQ. It's kind of fun. Um, and so this is specifically an IMAP student collaboration where it's through UNH, uh, Sonoma State University, and Howard. And we will plan to launch in 2025 and collect data for approximately six months. Uh, this is an uh, image of the engineering model. It will carry a UVPMT and an IRPA. Um, so a UVPMT, like we mentioned from Cypher 2, and it can measure like different electron, uh, measure like precipitating electron flux at different energies. And so this will study something extremely similar, if not the same thing that I was talking about, of neutral upwelling and how it relates to those precipitating electrons. And so one of the things that we do need to do uh, is the calibration of the UVPMT. If you did notice when we were looking at the Cypher 2 data, it gave voltages over time. Uh, at the time the Cypher 2 rocket was getting put together, the UVPMT was kind of added later on as kind of like an add-in of like, oh, yeah, we can include this instrument. So a calibration wasn't done at the time. Um, but now through the CubeSat, we have time. We have the students. We want to get this done. Um, so uh, an undergraduate <laughs> Kelly has been putting this together, working real hard on it. And we have a vacuum chamber with a rotating table uh, over in the Merle lab up there at UNH. And we're going to use this VUV deuterium light source and a uh, NIST calibrated photodiode for just cross calibration to make sure that we're looking at what we're looking at. And some of our future work that I'll be working with specifically is that once we have that calibration relation, very good to know, voltage to brightness, how do we get that brightness to density? Um, that is a little more difficult as it involves what actually is the UVPMT looking at. What is that whole volume that we're seeing? Um, so that has to have some time to do that. And then, uh, as I mentioned previously, we have that one optically thick emission line. What are the implications of that? Um, and kind of trying to go backwards uh, there. And also, one of the things that would be fun to do versus we just looked and compared events visually to PMAPs and uh, from the events on Cypher 2, uh, we want to also try to compare the electron temperatures and spikes from that that the rocket measured with the UVPMT data to see if we can connect the electron heating and the neutral density enhancements. And uh, if there's a connection there, try to see what the difference in time scales are there to bring it all the way back to the time scales with time, uh, with type 2 neutral upwelling and uh, the peanut effect. So just some quick acknowledgments. This is uh, I my co-advisors are Mark Lassard and Noe Lugas. Uh, Allison James was a graduate student who worked on this a lot uh, as well and helped me get started on this project. Uh, Brent Sadler right there is like from this one who worked very hard on the Sadler and Auto model and helped me out a lot. And one of the undergraduates in our lab, Alex Damsel, put together a lot of those plots as well. Um, and you know, we used EMSIS and IRI. We were and funded by the IMAP student collaboration, and we have a lot of amazing students that have done a lot of amazing work from the Merle Lab and from the 3 uq group. So definitely always want to thank them. And then just some of my references. And I think that is it for me. So yeah. Right on time. Uh, so is there any questions? In person, first. and then if there is any question, uh, like you can either raise your hand and zoom, and then you'll, you'll be able to talk. Uh, yeah. So it's cool that uh, you found like the correlation between the cycle measurements and the uh, sad Sadler and auto model. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering before new neutral upwelling is even thought of, how was it determined that the drag on channel was not from high enough drag? Oh, uh, well, not from what drag? Like that, that the ion upwelling was not sufficient to cause the drag. Ooh, that, that is a good question. I think a lot of it, because um, the CHAMP satellite data did spike a lot of looking into ions and ion upwelling, that would, that is absolutely there. Uh, I think it's from what I understand is that uh, the uh, neutral upwelling is not looked at nearly as much as the ion upwelling. So it's it seems to be one of those things where it's trying to look at all of the populations to see what their contributions could be. Uh, I guess if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, but so like, was there some like uh, like simulation done or something that said, oh, well, if there were this many ions up there that we measured, then it wouldn't have caused the drag we were seeing? 
That is a good question. I actually don't know that. Um, but yeah, that, that's a good question. I, I, I have a guess, uh, which is that uh, they, they could calculate how much drag was expected from ions because um, instruments like incoherent scatter radars can observe the ion upwelling, but can't observe the neutrals. Okay. And they found that uh, the drag was more than could be accounted for for the ions, so the neutrals is uh, what it had to be. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for adding that. Good to know. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. One more point is you're far above the orbit of channel. Yes. So you're you're in the exosphere, and seeing nitrogen in the exosphere is just kind of odd. I mean, MSIS doesn't even go up this high, and so I don't, I don't know what to make of that. But so yeah, it's it's odd. No, yeah, it definitely is odd, which is why it's um. Has, it was one of those things that the the timeline of all of this is that the Cypher 2 rocket was launched. We saw the data and we saw that exact same thing. And we're like, oh, <laughs> um, and sat on that for a little bit because we weren't sure what to make of it. And then the model was worked on more with uh, Brent and with other people to see that, oh, actually this might be give us a better idea of what these results might actually mean. Um, but yeah, that's why it is extremely strange because um, why did we see that? We see these spikes in voltages up at those altitudes for sure when we have a very specific <laughs> wavelength range to look at. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How, no, sorry, how did you know that uh, there was like this 14 second Rotation. So, like, because you feel like this similar voltage, or like you had other information? Oh, like from the rocket? Yeah, yeah, think, yeah. yeah. I think that was from like just data on the rocket itself, because okay. you have to, I think the rockets themselves kind of come with their own pointing okay. information. So, and like from, yeah, so I think that's kind of where that came from. Yeah. But does that, because you also to like you had to correct for it, but that was in situ machine on right? Does that matter that much that the uh, red gets is spinning for your measurements or? Uh, I don't know. Cause I was definitely looking at it in more of like a, uh, well, where are we pointing yeah. while we're spinning? So that right. was kind of what was accounted for. But in yeah. terms of like, cause it does measure like more photons than anything. Yeah. It measures photons. So mm -hmm. that's where I don't think it would necessarily affect the photons are measuring or anything like that or the instrument itself um but that is something to think about absolutely okay. cool thank you for that yeah. well it seems we don't have any okay. questions online any last question in person well let's finish it again <laughs> now it's time to switch to our next speaker tyler thank you did a great job Whenever you're ready. All right. Yeah, we can. If you could move the window into the camera. Oh, yeah. Do you need to move my laptop? Does that work? Oh, that thing. Yeah. The sheet of the camera. On the. Oh, you can leave that. The bird just at. Yeah. Just. You can leave that. Oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. I can move this too. Whenever you're ready, I, I, I can just let this. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I will not be able to follow up with a, as good of a talk as kind of just gave. That was very nice. And so many good figures in it. You know, I, I have a lot more words in my head. So it's a nice thing to show. So um, thank you all for the opportunity. Today, I'm going to be talking about uh, dipolarization front structure in dynamics with uh, MMS. Um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with MMS, so I'm going to just start by giving like a very, very general outline for those of you that are curious. And if you can even read that, you can see all the different suite of instruments that are on MMS. But MMS are these four cool looking probes right here that fly through the magnetosphere. Um, they are all identical and they generally orbit in this tetrahedral um, shape volume. Uh, and what that allows us to do is be able to basically uh, calculate a current sheet across that whole thing or 
look at common structures um, in those different satellites, but in this different pattern, um, sort of replaced Themis in some ways, or is a kind of an extension of Themis, but Themis uses, uh, it has a larger uh, spacecraft separation, and it generally flies in the string of pearls formation, so that's like one after another. So each of those has their own benefits to them. Um, so one thing that's good about MMS is that it's much closer uh, than Themis, so you can see structures, um, common structures in all of those versus like very large separations. But then of course, it's harder to see the evolution of something um, as it passes through. So yeah, there's tons of different instruments that we can measure uh, the electric fields, magnetic fields, um, particles and the plasma properties, basically probing everything that we could possibly want to probe. Um, and that's MMS. So I now wanna direct everyone towards the magnetosphere. Um, so, Today we're going to be focusing on the night side, so this side of the magnetosphere. Um, a lot of fun stuff happens over here, but today we're going to focus over here. So basically, uh, when magnetic reconnection happens, so when field lines reconnect, there are a lot of associated uh, things that we see in space, right? And I'm trying to be very general here because there is no complete theory of magnetic reconnection and uh, some of the things that we're looking at are observables at the end of the day to try to put together a larger picture of what's going on. So magnetic reconnection happens. As far as we know, there are flows that fly towards Earth. They fly away from Earth. Um, and those flows have different properties sometimes. But generally, when we make uh, a detection of one of those flows, they have a very enhanced uh, electric magnetic field in the Z direction. So right here, this is these are called LMN coordinates. Basically, those are just uh, maximum, minimum, uh, and normal variation. I'll get into that later. But in this direction, BZ, or it would be the L. Okay, in this case, this is L, but for, uh, for dipolarization fronts, we shift it this way. Um, so basically, an enhancement in the northward direction. Um, so, what else do you see with it? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. So, here's an example of what I'm talking about um, one is in the inner magnetosphere, and one is in the magneto tail. So, if we look back, just over here, the magneto tail is this region over here. And as we get closer anywhere, this is the inner magnetosphere. So the magnetosphere becomes more dipolar as you move inward. And uh, as you move outward, these field lines are stretched. So when we make these detections in the inner magnetosphere, we can see that the fields are, uh, they, they're a little bit higher. The field is becoming dipolar. Um, and we can see this uh, sort of huge front like structure. But when we move up to the tail, the fields are a lot, they're a lot closer to zero. They're, it's a lot more calm in the plasma sheet of the tail. And then when the dipolarization front comes in, it's a very clear BZ structure here, very front light. Um, it's in, uh, increasing over about a second and a half here, maybe even less. Um, so that's the general difference um, between those two. So now basically we have seen what this structure looks like. We don't want to make any assumptions about what's going on in the plasma, about what the other field things are doing. We just want to find things where the BZ goes like that, right? So if, if you uh, want to make an algorithm, you have to go into the literature a little bit and see what other people are doing. <laughs> and then um, basically trial and error, right? So the basic criteria we, we listed are that the delta BZ, so that change, has to be at least eight nanoteslas, because sometimes there are other things that cause fluctuations in the data. Um, the, the second thing is we have this elevation angle right here. So this is just this equation right here, our tangent, it's just basically wanting the BZ component to be greater than the BX and BY for at least one data point. Um, so we also want to make sure that events are separated by at least two minutes. And this wasn't something that we were really considering until I talked to Chul at AGU, uh, and he was talking about uh, the dipolarization front algorithm that they had been using. Um, and basically, if you don't separate events, a dipolarization front comes in, scrambles the particles in the area, you no longer have a maximally distribution, or you know, there wasn't a maximally distribution to begin with, but you're getting further and further away from uh, understanding what's going on and you're moving towards turbulence. So we want to be able to kind of separate these events and have it in this ideal current sheet situation. Dipolarization front comes in, what's happening right now, instead of already dealing with you know things moving around and being turbulent, turbulent in the first place. Um, okay, so other than the magnetic field, 
Uh, so we also want to make sure that the maximum comes after the minimum because we would basically be looking at the opposite of the dipolarization from the becoming very non dipolar very quickly. Not, not generally seen unless you're moving in and out of regions in the magnetosphere. Um, so yeah, other than the magnetic field, we also want to make sure that we're in the current sheet. So these uh, basically what we, we we have here is that the absolute value of y gsm. So this is kind of looking down at Earth in x in the xy plane. We want to make sure that uh, MMS stays within 15 re in that plane. If it goes out of that, it's likely in the lows. Um, and we're being a little bit conservative here because, of course, the current sheet and lobes change. The magnetic sphere is a dynamic thing, and it, it changes over time. Um, so the differences between these criteria for the inner and outer magnetosphere to find these dipolarization fronts uh, are simply one the criteria in which we're finding them. You'll notice we're using SM coordinates once we shift into the inner magnetosphere, as that's just a little bit more standard to use. Um, so the special thing about the inner magnetosphere is we do this very basic model subtraction. In 1989, Siganenko made a very good model, works very well. Um, and we use that in combination with a uh, more, more current IGRF model. And this basically just subtracts that dipolar field and it makes the dipolarization fronts look like those in the magneto tail a lot more. So you just see fields around zero, big spike, and then it calms down over some amount of time. That's the phone. Mm -hmm. Don't answer what? It's a spam call. <laughs> 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 so even if you have a question. <laughs> Okay. They'll call back if the question. <laughs> so I apologize for this kind of boring screen, but I just wanted to kind of show everyone why we're selecting um, with only for how we're selecting with the magnetic field and the coordinates, but also just to re, re nail down that point that we do not want to make any uh, assumptions about what's happening in the plasma. Um, we don't want to say, oh, yes, but the density will decrease or something that we want to find that out once we've selected all these vents just from the magnetic field and uh, the placement of MMS. So there's a lot more things. Don't look at all of it yet, please. <laughs> so, um, so far, once you've de developed that uh, algorithm, um, I've run it since from May uh, 2018 to October 2018. And so far, using those criteria, it found um, 289 depolarization fronts. The majority of those are in the magneto tail. Um, and so the vast majority of them are in the magneto tail. Um, and then 27 were the, in the inner magnetosphere. And basically what I'm showing you in these plots is kind of a cross section, just one month of those results. So we start over here in the top left. Um, we can just see, if you can see it, there are a number of depolarization fronts per hour. So I've binned it per hour, how many detections did it make? And then below that, we have some data from Omni. Uh, we have the interplanetary BC, we have uh, solar wind speed, we have SIMH and AL index, which is showing the substorms and uh, storm activity. Um, and then over on the right here, I've shown the plots of MMS. So when we see a red region like this, this is not a region of interest. So basically when any of, the, any of these are in the red, I've put a red bar here. And we can see that the white uh, spaces are the regions of interest. So, Basically, before we can make any large conclusion or any conclusion really about when dipolarization fronts are happening, we also have to make sure that uh, we don't have bias in the regions of interest that we have. So on a first glance, this picture kind of, uh, it, it is uh, in agreement with the common idea of when depolarization fronts are happening, AKA when there's forcing on the magnetosphere due to some sort of interplanetary geomagnetic condition uh, there is magnetic reconnection and therefore dipolarization fronts. Um, so in this region, you can see uh, the BZ is mostly positive and there's no dipolarization fronts. That's uh, when interplanetary BZ is negative, that's called there's forcing on the magnetosphere. Um, we can also see that they're relatively slow uh, solar wind speeds and not, no storms, maybe a little substorm happening, but there's really no dipolarization fronts. And when there's alphanic fluctuations or these co-rotating interaction regions um, in the solar wind, you see these huge uh, jumps in, um, in speed. 
uh, there are dipolarization fronts, especially like you can almost see they're associated with these um, events. And then finally, we have this massive storm. Um, it was from a coronal mass ejection, uh, and there were quite a few depolarization fronts. However, again, if we think if we look back to this, we have to see that we have to be careful because there is limited availability for MMS here, and we can't really make a huge conclusion there. So we're basically going to keep doing this for several months, and then hopefully. Uh, actually make some statistical derivation from this, but this is sort of one view of uh, where the project is going, um, and that's answering the question, when do dipolarization fronts happen? What kind of environments are dipolarization fronts preferred in? Um, and this is of interest for, for several reasons, because there are different groups that have different ideas of when magnetic reconnection happens, aka uh, it's sort of one to one with when are these dipolarization fronts happening. Um, I spoke to uh, Larry Lines from UCLA. He's very interested in kind of answering this question of is alphanic fluctuations uh, in the interplanetary BZ more important than negative BZ, which is the classical idea of magnetospheric forcing. Um, so we found preliminarily so far that when there's huge alphanic fluctuations in the BZ, there's a ton of dipolarization fronts. But again, we have to be careful. We have to keep looking at more and more data and um, kind of pulling these different regions of when did the solar wind fast? How many dipolarization fronts did we see? Was MMS in the right place? And, and so on. So very preliminary, but a little bit exciting. Go ahead. Are there orange ones? Oh, yes. So, so it's really, really hard to see. There's uh, one that's there. I think there's one in there, and there's some over here. Uh, I was just trying yeah. to figure out if they were like only during the storm or if they were <laughs> it's, it's hard because I was trying to, if I increase the bin size, it, you know what I mean? It's a, yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. It's a it, thing it, to keep like in there's mind. some besides just the storm. Yes. Maybe I'll put arrows next time. And if there's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And, uh, when there are these large storms and substorms, we don't necessarily see a ton of depolarization fronts right after that, but it does seem so far to be more associated with the alphanic fluctuations, which that's a very preliminary thing. We really have to check into that, but uh, there's one result. Um, so as I was saying, you can largely make the conclusion that they're occurring when there's a geomagnetic disturbance. So with all these events, and we're going to get more. We want to understand at least on the on the first level where are they going and how fast are they going. So we use two different techniques to, to figure this out. One is the classic timing analysis, where you simply identify a common feature in these different things and then just subtract the timing differences between them. Uh, if you have the spacecraft locations, you can basically get a uh, velocity and a normal vector. So it is has a lot of um, assumptions, mainly linearity and planarity of the um, spacecraft. So it's it's a it's a tried and true technique, but there are uh, many limitations with it. Um, so we're also using minimum variance analysis, which is, as I was mentioning before, determining a maximum uh, intermediate and minimum direction. So basically, we have our data right in uh, z, x, and y, and we have our probe flying through space. If there's a dipolarization front that is really a one-dimensional structure, right? If it's really just a dipolarizing structure in the Z direction, what if we can like basically rotate that coordinate system such that there's a maximum direction, there's a minimum, which is at zero, and then there's an intermediate that sort of fluctuates in between the two. And that's the idea, and it's using uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, so the minimum component, uh, or sorry, the Yes, the minimum component uh, pr provides the uh, the normal direction. The the labels are a little bit confusing. I always want to call M and flip them around because we're five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> I saw. I saw. Sorry. I was trying to not like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. No. Um, so basically, we're performing these two different techniques um, to figure out where they're going, and this is what it looks like in general. So it's it's very messy, um, but. So over here we have, this is moving away from Earth, this is towards Earth, and you can barely see where all these arrows are pointing. They're kind of pointing in all different directions, and um, it's a little bit messy to see. Uh, and one thing is clear, there are discrepancies between the two of them. Some only 70 of the events have an angle less than 25 uh, degrees between them. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the reasons that they're different is simply because they use completely different methods to find out this normal vector. But there are also physical differences, which uh, both of them can provide a very reasonable estimate for the normal vector. But the 
there's physical differences between them. Timing analysis can say it points this way, but if the minimum variance analysis says this way, it could have been because the bubble shape passed by this way or the structure of the dipolarization front that we don't really know. So we can instead look at the statistical view. Um, so this is just a histogram that's wrapped around a unit circle, okay? So when we're looking at zero, uh, this is, and uh, this is an angle, or sorry, this is an arrow pointing directly towards Earth, and then 180 degrees is the opposite. So despite that kind of messy view, uh, overall, the methods actually largely agree with each other. Um, there are small populations that are outliers, which we are certainly trying to look into understanding, but overall, we can see that we look at the XZ plane, for instance, in both the, for the magneto tail, Minimum variance analysis and timing analysis largely gives you a population centered around the same area. So despite physical differences, we see large agreement in um, the overall direction in which they're going. Now, you may notice these little outlier populations. Um, and despite the fact that uh, the other bits of the populations do overlap quite well and agree, we don't know why. That's uh, one of the reasons we want to look into this difference. Um, so. There is a couple other techniques that we're looking to use on other, other coordinate systems that we can shift into basically that provide a much better agreement with timing analysis. Um, so that's something that we're looking uh, to do now. What's the difference between the left and the right plot within each panel? Uh, the left and the right within each panel. Uh, so this is the XY plane and this is XZ plane. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I should have mentioned that. So this is sort of in the current sheet, right? So if you're if you're looking, am I going uh, downward or duskward, uh, essentially? And in the XZ plane, am I going uh, towards the pole or below the pole? Um, yeah, of course. So there's a lot of future work now. Um, we've we've got a basic code that can find these depolarization fronts. We are developing other things to basically scrutinize and put them into different categories. Um, so we need to keep running the code. Uh, we have to understand those differences between the techniques better. But then we also have to investigate the actual particle uh, dynamics of the depolarization front. So this is using the fast plasma investigation, BEEPS, uh, HPCA, which is the hot plasma composition analyzer, I believe. Um, so using all these different tools to look at the actual behavior, the temperature, the divergence of the, of the pressure, um, all these different things to actually understand, uh, are there differences between depolarization fronts? Can you have two identical magnetic structures that have different particle behavior associated with them. Um, and then finally, calculating uh, J dot E and J dot E prime. So we can get a current estimate in the frame of the dipolarization front with J dot E. Um, and then we can also shift to this overall uh, magnetosphere kind of view. So in the, in the frame of the plasma itself. And we can understand if energy is being transferred to particles or fields. Um, some preliminary studies have shown that you can indeed separate dipolarization fronts based on uh, J dot E, which is something that's interesting to look into. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So thank you, everyone. And uh, if there's any questions, then... Um, yes, a question about the differences that you're seeing in the arrival directions for uh, the two methods. Are, are the differences random or systematic? Um, so that's a, that's a great question. So we've tried to separate them. So a, a common method of, of figuring out if the minimum variance analysis is good or not is looking at the eigenvalue ratio between the second and third. Um, so we were looking into if there's a higher eigenvalue ratio, do they agree more? The answer is no, there's no correlation. Um, so there is there doesn't seem to be a, cor a correlation between the differences. Uh, we've kept trying to scrutinize further and further, but could be physical differences, and that's why. And just uh, to check on the MVA, um, do you filter out some evidence for which that the eigenvalue type of ratio then is too low? Yes, so I, I did forget to mention that. Okay. So if the eigenvalue ratio, we're using five as a cutoff, um, if it's below that, the event is even considered. Okay, yeah. So I should mention the depolarization front criteria gives a full list, and then we apply some other further scrutiny. Uh, we scrutinize that list further, and then we get that uh, basically 300 events that I was shown. Okay. Yeah. Well, have you or are you planning to do an overlap analysis with the list that Joel and I think from this? That would be fantastic. We're, I would, uh, especially it, after Joel and I were talking this morning, I, I would. Definitely like to pass that along to my uh, my group. Do the dates overlap? Uh, I'm not sure actually. I don't know if we talked about the dates. 
Well, we're going to extend the study too, so they may overlap if they don't already. The point of problem is they're coming from Simmons and then Van or OCD. So if they were in the fail, but I think some gaps where they're not overlapping that are substantial, but I'm not sure. But we could definitely check. Yeah. And I'm looking basically, I want to just keep running this code for any time that MMS is in the magneto tail. Um, there are regions. Times of the year when MMS kind of went forward to the front of the magnetic sphere or around in the lobes. Yeah. So any time that it's in the tail, uh, that's where we're interested. Well, that's that's the question I feel like. Um, so the normal variance analysis, I think that's just like that's just eigenvalue decomposition on the covariance matrix. Yes, right? exactly. Okay. Yeah. So that's uh yeah, I mm -hmm. why you have you're cutting off. Ask if you have uh, too much of an eigenvalue ratio. Is that like, phrase max? Is that like nested? You have like a maximal variance directive, and then yes. you're intermediate. And if that's beyond either, then does it does you extend it in both ways, like from the maximum to the intermediate and the intermediate to the. Uh, it's basically the, like there's an eigenbasis, yeah. um, and there's three eigenvalues associated with which each, each uh, eigenvector. Yeah. So um, usually, the, so the the L, the the maximum one, has an enormous eigenvalue. Um, the intermediate has a much smaller one, and then we, I in my code, I normalize the eigen the third one to always be one. So I really just need to look at the second eigenvalue, and basically, if that's over five, oh, okay. That's it. There's not really, yeah, it's um, it's not any more complex than that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, hi there, Tyler. This is Jason from online, if you can hear me. So, uh, yeah, quick question, just following up on uh, Eric's point about the systematic versus random uh, errors. If you go back to your uh, polar histogram slide for just a second, I think maybe that it seems to me like they're definitely not random, it's basically comparing the blue panels on the left to the uh, yellow or orange ones on the right. So maybe there is some, you know, could be something systematic, but certainly not random in the sense that they're at least all, you know, for instance, that the distribution is to the right of the hemisphere as opposed to scattered in any direction, right? So it's probably That's a great point. I, yes. Mm -hmm. I hope I wasn't. I, I I didn't want to answer that it was random or not because I, I should have said I don't have a good answer for that, but it's certainly not uh, random. Um, thank you, Jason. Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Still, so, I'm, I'm not sure either necessarily about the subtle differences, but still interesting to think about. And these plots are nice to kind of visualize, you know, how just yeah geometrically where they're distributed and, and planes there. So yeah, very good. One of the basic ideas is, especially in the, the timing analysis, so we've already scrutinized the minimum variance analysis via that eigenvalue ratio, and that's generally what people use in order to just even consider if it's good or not. But the timing analysis here, if the so if the spacecraft are too close to, to each other, then there is an issue. Um, it gives a, a, the inaccurate, as these probes get closer and closer, the uncertainty in the timing analysis goes up. So there is also, it's, yeah, it's it's about the time resolution and also just like, can you really separate, are these things right next to each other? Yeah, yeah. So uh, it also, there can be a lot of difficulties in identifying those common structures. Um, so. What's the distance range typically between the different states? Uh, it's slightly variable, but it's, uh, it's a really good question. I knew this very recently. <laughs> no bad uh, it, it is variable. Um, but it's on the order of less than a thousand kilometers. Yeah, I think it's typically tens of kilometers. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. but they do change as they as they get closer. The spacecraft yeah. tend to get closer together, so it's hard to tell. Like if I'm at minus twenty five re versus geosynchronous orbit, they, it could be very different shapes okay. as well as separations. So. Um, that's something yeah, else. yeah. I know in the day side, it's usually around 10 kilometers, probably in the tail, maybe 20 or 30 uh, on average, something like that. But, but not, a, yeah, not a thousand, but, <laughs> but yes. Yeah, we just, <laughs> yeah. So there is those actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Sorry. And so and maybe you said about, did you try to correlate that with discrepancies, like between like your timing? Because you mentioned that it could be one effect that could explain discrepancies, like, because if like space travel is very, very close. And then when they are further away, you might have a better distance. Do you try to correlate that distance? Maybe? Not yet, but that's that's definitely something we're looking into. As well as, so we found a paper recently that basically was just talking about these two methods are not 
uh, always very comparable for a for a bounce shock, something very distinct. These two methods generally agree very well with each other. Okay. Um, but for something like a depolarization front um, with that polarizing flux bundle reaching off of the thing, like it, it's a much it's a complicated and more transient thing happening. Um, so one of the techniques we're looking is you take the you take an L from the LMN coordinates and then you cross that with J, like the vector, like the current that you can derive and, and basically you know, can create a new that gives you another normal vector. So the idea is that the the current is mainly in the y direction, j y, and in a depolarization front. And then if you cross that with l, you get n going forward. So the uh, papers show that that if you just do that and modify your minimum variance analysis, the angle separation just goes down to you know it's the agreement's much much better. So if that happens for us, we can just use that technique instead. Yeah. Thank you. You've only done about a month so far. It's this analysis, right? A month. Uh, um, yeah. So, so this this part of it. So, okay. This is actually showing you uh, five minutes. Five months. Okay. Yeah. So that omni plot. So there's multiple aspects of this project. One is finding out when they are happening, and if we can compare that to like what's happening in the uh, interplanetary medium. Or yeah. So another part of that is categorizing the depolarization front. So this is part of the categorizing thing. We need to do more work on the Omni side in figuring out where the spacecraft are. Um, basically, just yeah. So my question was going to be: Are you going to do more like this analysis in the five months? And you know, feel like you've answered yes to that already. Yeah. Um. So now my question is: uh, If and when you do that, and maybe you have some huge like multi-year data set where you do this analysis on that, however long it'll take to run. Uh, do you think you can actually extract more, like, what would you expect to see finer detail about, like, these plots, for example, or maybe you can reduce the bin size because you have so many more data, so many more events, and see maybe more patterns. And sure, there are systematic differences, but maybe determine what those differences are and what, what do you expect to see from that? It's a really good question. So absolutely, yeah. Uh, as we get more data, um, so I could reduce the bin sizes here. Um, I just it would take more work, and yeah. I plan on doing that. Um, so like for the purposes of this uh, this presentation, I put together this. Uh, yeah. So we're already planning on doing a lot more work on all this data and just running the program for a longer amount of time. Um, what do I expect to see? Um, well, I because we're using a bunch of different papers, ideas as to how to separate the dipolarization fronts. I'd like to see if this, uh, you know, and a study at this scale for dipolarization fronts hasn't really been done. I've seen some that use hundreds, but hopefully we have like over, you know, thousands that we're looking at. Um, I would, I'm just curious to see if we agree with um, a lot of the other papers, such as uh, so Schmidt and Al Cake are two different people in the fields right now that are separating and categorizing dipolarization fronts. I want to see if we agree or if we find out anything else uh, different. And also, if you you know, if you could predict when depolarization fronts are happening, that would be pretty great too. <laughs> Is there any last question? Let's speak our Thank you very much, both of you. That was a very great presentation. Yeah. Really nice. Great. Uh, see you next week, everyone, for another seminar.